Lord, as we sit down with you and open this gospel, the last gospel of the Bible, the book of Revelation, we begin to understand what the Father, what you as God the Son and the Holy Spirit so much desire each one of us to know individually and provide historical information that gives us the understanding of who you are and what is your purpose for each one of us and what is coming as you are considering leaving heaven to take us home so that we can be with you eternally. I want to thank you, Father, for your amazing grace and the book of Revelation, for there is much in there to give us courage and to give us enthusiasm to gain faith and trust and belief and, Lord, to be committed to walking with you until you come. For we ask it in Jesus' name. And of course, Lord, bless Barbara as Barbara is used by you to present the messages to the seven churches. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. 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 All right. So, have we realized with the churches that God's focus is really spiritual? Yep. Isn't it? Everything that we're seeing with the, with the seven churches. So tonight we're going to start with Thyatira. And that was a fun one to say. And so if you get your, your cheat sheets out, I don't know if you, you brought your cheat sheets with you, but if you brought them, we'll see that Thyatira, the time period for Thyatira is about 538 to 1500 BC. So this church was the longest time period. Right. This, uh, this time period also call, covers a period of in history that many of you know about if you think about it. Correct. And it was called what? Middle Ages or the Dark Ages? The Middle Ages or the Dark Ages. The Dark Ages. Yes. The dark ages. And why would they have been called the Dark Ages? Because of the persecution of the saints primarily. Oh, that's, that's one reason. Because right. all science and advancement and everything was basically a closed book. And Jill, what, what did you tell me the other day? About the Dark Ages? Yeah. They didn't write history down. They didn't write any history down. And that's why it was called the Dark Ages. There's, so there's no, there's no history. history uh, you mean spiritual history? History in general. History in general. Really? They weren't allowed to have books. They were not. They were not allowed to have that's books. before Jesus. No, this is after Jesus. I think it's like, uh, 538 A.D. Not BC. Not BC, after Christ. No, I thought you said BC. No. no. If you did, I apologize because it was 538 AD to 1500 AD. That's a long time. That's a long time. 1,260 days. Correct. 1,260 days. So and we are, going to, we are going to unpack that. And we're going to unpack the 1,260 days, not tonight. But in one of our lessons in, in the coming evenings. Yeah. All right. So now let's start with Revelation 2, 18 through 29. Can I get a reader, a long-winded reader, because this is a long portion of scripture. And just so you know, the highlighted, the highlighted portions we're going to be delving more into throughout this lesson. So go ahead. Then unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write, This thing saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine grass. I know thy works, and charity, and service, and faith, and thy patience, and thy works, and the last to be more than the first. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, who call herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat the things unto idols. Continuing? Yep. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know 
that I am he which searches the rain, rains and parts, and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. But unto you I say, and unto the rest of Tyre, as many as have not this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden. But that which ye have already hold fast till I come, and he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the, unto the end, to him I will give power over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, and as I received of my father. And I will give him the morning star, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit said unto the churches. Okay. This is a lot to unpack. But first of all, let's talk about Thyatira itself. It was the smallest and least important of the seven cities addressed in Revelation. So it wasn't a big city like uh, uh, Smyrna and, and Pergamos was. This Thyatira uh, was not um, a very large city. It had no political importance <clears throat> or cultural significance, which fits the time period if you think about it. The city was known for many trades, such as garment, making bronze, smithing, tanning, leather, working, pottery, baking, dyeing, and manufacturing of royal purple and woolen goods. Lydia, do you guys remember Lydia in the Bible? Yep. Lydia, the, the uh, uh, purple dealer in Philippi, was the first Christian convert in Europe. She was from Thyatira, Acts 1614 says, and a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshiped God, heard us, whose heart was the Lord opened, that she attended into the things that were spoken of Paul. And when she was baptized in her household, she besought us, saying, if ye have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come unto me, come into my house, and abide there and she prevailed upon us. Now, this whole little, there's a little note on the bottom that I made for myself, but <clears throat> ignore that. Um, how did they make purple originally? There's a little tiny sea snail slug kind of thing. Yeah. And out of like thousands of them, you can get a drop of blue to make that purple. Yeah. So that's how they made purple originally. But here in Thyatira, they found this, this matter root. And so then they were able to make this uh, uh, purple dye out of the matter root rather than out of the shellfish. So the citizens of Thyatira were mainly poor laborers and tradesmen. In contrast to the well-situated residents of the previous three cities, the city had many trade guilds, and that's interesting that it had the trade guilds, because don't we have a lot of trade guilds today? Yeah, we do. Yeah. Unions, they're called? Yeah. Yeah. Trade guild members were expected to attend the guild festivals in honor of the patron god and to share a common meal in the temple that included drunkenness and eating meat sacrificed to the patron God. So what does God say? There were two things he hated? Eating the, the food that sacrificed to idol. Yeah. Yeah. And he didn't particularly like their, um, their drunkenness. The festivals usually ended with immoral activities with temple prostitutes. Those who refused to participate in the festival could suffer serious consequences. Expulsion from the trade guilds, ridicule, as well as hardships of social isolation and economic sanctions. Are we seeing that again today? Social isolation and economic sanctions. So this is what, ha this is what was going on in Thyatira. This created serious problems for the Christians. They could not join the trade guilds without participating in the festivals. So Christ here introduces himself to this church as the son of God, the one whose eyes are as a flame of fire. And we see that from Revelation 2.18. And unto the angel of the church of Thyatira write, 
These things saith the Son of God, who hath eyes like a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. So, well, it, this, is, this is really interesting here. To John, Jesus appeared to him differently than he did to the church of Thyatira. He comes as the Son of God to Thyatira, and yet in Revelation 1.13, he comes in the midst of the candlesticks as the Son of Man. Why would that be different? Why do you think that would be different? You can do a wild guess, it's okay. So I, I'm, I'm thinking Son of Man because he's trying to show that he's come and he's part of us. But Son of God is coming with the judgment. Yeah. yeah. Well, as he, he came as Son of Man, that's who John knew him as. Yeah. yeah. So John really knew him as the Son of Man. So to John, he was John's friend. He was one like him. He walked among him. He was John's pastor. He was his mentor, wasn't he? So that's how John knew him. Now as he comes to Thyatira, he's coming as the son of God. Why is that different? Because of their sin. They want to know that who's in charge. You know, I can see what you're doing. Yeah. So what you're saying is true. He's coming as the son of God because he's showing his authority. He's going, I've got this, you guys. Right? So his, eyes, his flaming eyes denote his penetrating ability to see what's in the innermost parts of humans. So he, the, the eyes show that he knows the heart. He knows what, what, what people think. And I will, give every, I will give unto every one of you according to your works. He is the one who searches the kidneys. And this never has made sense to me, but it is, how it, it is the way it is. The, the kidneys are the seat of emotions. One would think, I've always considered the heart, my, you know, I think my emotions come from the heart. But in the Bible, it comes from the kidneys. The heart is the seat of intelligence. It's your thinking. So in, in scripture, it's a little di bit different than how we think of it today. The ability to search kidneys and hearts belongs only to God. I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, reins as kidneys, and we'll see that here again in a minute, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. And the Bible commentary talks about this. Reins are the kidneys, which anciently were thought to be the seat of will and affections. Mm -hmm. We see this in Psalm 7, 9. Oh, let the wickedness of the wicked come to an end, but establish the just. For the righteous God trieth the hearts and the reins, which are the kidneys. And then we see hearts here in scripture talking about the intellect. Christ penetrates both thoughts and emotions. Christ's judgment is because he sees and takes into consideration the secrets of the heart. So when he takes into consideration the secrets of the heart, he's taking into consideration the secrets of our intelligence or how we're thinking, how we, how we feel, how we believe. So he says, um, uh, Jeremiah eleven twenty says, But, O Lord of hosts, that judgest righteously, that triest the reins of the heart, let me see thy vengeance on them. For thee have I revealed my cause. And so we see that, that Christ is the one who really sees in our innermost parts. Um, also in uh, Samuel 16, 7, the Lord san said to Samuel, look on his countenance or on his height of his stature because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh upon the heart. And who was he talking about when, when he was having that conversation? David. David? Mm -hmm. No, 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 Saul. Or Saul. No, Saul. 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 So now we're going to move down and look at the, Christ's feet in, this, in these scriptures. Christ's feet, which look like burnished bronze, symbolizes his uncompromising stance against seductive influences of the church. So when you see that brass, he's taking a firm stand 
Thyatira is described by Jesus as a loving, faithful, service-oriented, and persevering church. Amen. And we're going to talk about that, that persevering church and a little bit about them at, before we leave Thyatira. Unlike the church in Ephesus, whose love was fading, this church is noted for an increase in faith and love. Their last works were greater than their first. In the New Testament, love and faith go together. We see that in Galatians 5, 6. For in Jesus Christ, neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but faith which works by love. Ephesians 1, 5 says, Wherefore I also, after I heard your faith in the Lord Jesus, and love unto all the saints. Then again in 1 Thessalonians 3, 6, But now when Timotheus came from you unto us, he brought us good tidings for your what? Faith and charity. <clears throat> that we have good remembrance of us always, desiring greatly to see us. <clears throat> We also to see you. Furthermore, service is an outcome of love. In Revelations 1, 3, blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein. For the time is at hand, and perseverance is a product of what? Faith. Faith. So perseverance <clears throat> is important to God because it, it shows that, that we're faithful. In Colossians, we see the same thing again with faith. If we continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved from the hope of the gospel which we have heard and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, wherefore I, Paul, am, am a minister. And then again, we've got several scriptures here. Thessalonians 1, 3, and 4. We are bound to thank God always for his for for as you brethren as it is meet because that your faith groweth exceedingly and the charity every one of you all toward each other abound. So are we getting a hint that this faith and charity is a, is is pretty consistent uh, and important for this church so that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith in all persecutions and tribulations that ye endure. So we this, see this church, too, suffering a lot of persecution and tribulation. The big problem for this church was that they tolerated the teachings of an influential woman in their midst. Yep. Jesus names her Jezebel. Amen. After the notorious wife of King Agab in the time of Elijah who led the apostasy of Israel. Now, most of us have heard of Ahab. Yep. If not, we've heard of Elijah, Elijah's battle with Ahab on Mount Carmel, haven't we? Where they, where they, God said, "Okay, we're going to decide who's who's really in charge," and we know how that ended up. But let's go back to this woman, Jezebel. First Kings sixteen thirty-one through thirty-three says, "And it came to pass, as it had been a light thing for him to walk in his sins." of Jeroboam the son of Nebat. He took to wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbal, king of the Zidonians, and went and served Baal and worshiped him. And he reared up an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he built in Samaria. And Ahab made a grove, and Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him. So he was really upset with um, Ahab. So this is Ahab's wife that claimed to be a prophet? She, was a, yeah. she claimed to be a prophetess, Jezebel. Yeah, this woman Jezebel claimed to be a prophetess with a direct message from God stating that it was all right for Christians to go along with the requirements set by the guild, the associations of the artisans and the merchant. But if you go back and look at Jezebel, Jezebel was as brutal as anyone in the Old Testament that went against God's people. She had no problems. They were putting prophets to death. They were putting the people of God to death left and right. They were actually hiding. They, they'd hide them in small groups in caves uh, to protect them. 
And so we know that after Elijah, one second, after Elijah had his battle with, uh, the, the, with Baal and Ahab on the top of Mount Carmel, Jezebel was ticked because they killed all the, the, the prophets of Baal. Mm -hmm. And so she was really upset and she was coming after Elijah and that's why Elijah ran. He got scared and ran. Even after all he'd been through, he got scared and ran because she's so, so nasty. This Jezebel's, <clears throat> the teaching of Jezebel's was on Tiatera, Tiatera's church. Just because Jezebel does not exist during Tiatera, is it? No, she wasn't, she wasn't alive then. It's symbolic. Symbolic. But what she was doing with Thyatira was causing... Yeah, she was... Yeah. Thyatira practice. She was teaching compromise. She was teaching that it was okay to have these, um, these, these moments with the, pros the, the temple prostitutes to worship Baal. It was okay to worship other gods. It was okay not to keep God's law. All these things were okay. And that's not a whole lot different than... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So God did a lot of winking, is what he's trying to say. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know how much winking he did. Yeah, no, it's sarcasm. Yeah. Is, we have to be careful with the teaching. We might hear this Jezebel teaching now. Yeah, we do hear Jezebel's teaching now. And, yeah. And this was also during the persecution of the church. 538 to 1500. Well, yeah. Go ahead, because I think we, you're going to answer that question. Just go ahead. I think I'm, I know where you're going. Well, what, she's, what, what it says here, if you look at, at Revelation 2.20 at the bottom, she caused his servants to commit fornication right. and to eat things sacrificed to idols. Right. Both of those things God abhorred. Right. And her teaching, her teaching was similar to the teaching of the Nicolaitans and the teachings of Balaam. And we're going to put those up again just as a review because there's some of you that are here tonight that weren't here last time. So I want to take a look at those teachings again. Because she seduced the members to eat things sacrificed to idols and commit fornication, her seduction influences made a great impact on the church, leading them astray to compromise with paganism and apostasy. Jezebel is referred to spiritually as a harlot, and her seductive activities as immorality. And here's the other thing that God says, I gave her space to repent of her fornication and she repented not. Right. A symbolic ref reference to her activities of advocating compromise with paganism. Yeah. Well, you probably can't see a lot of persecution with this church because they seem okay to the pagans. <laughs> they come to the festivals. That's, that's exactly it. The, 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 the significance here is that just like during the time of the time of Elijah, the church willingly abdicated to the new teaching, and the church became the persecution of the pure church. And Tyatar, at the end of the day, the persecution that the Christians had came from fellow Christians who had abdicated, and that's very important that we understand. So well, we end. We need. But yeah, But if we look at the church through time, look at what happened with Christ. Yes. Who persecuted Christ? Exactly. The Jews. The Jews, yeah. didn't they? His people persecuted him. Exactly. Who was putting the? Who was? Who was turning the Christians in to be put to death? Exactly. Other Christians. Yes. And so we see that this compromise happens and and I'm sure that these these compromised Christians that believe they're doing the right thing right. And, and Barbara when it comes to the end of time who do you think is going to to persecute us the most yeah yeah it's going to come from within exactly. Byron you wanted to say something and then well, I got him you know, in the end it's going to be in the apostate Protestant church that does the persecuting yeah that gives the the, <clears throat> the muscle. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's going to come. It's going to come from within ourselves as well. Yeah. It's not just going to be other Christian churches. It will happen within our own ranks. Wow. 
So just the Nicolaitan beliefs, I'm just going to read some of the highlighted parts here of the Nicolaitan beliefs. The Nicolaitans believed and said that a person is saved by grace. Oh my God. Where have we heard this? We heard this all Once saved, always saved. And so therefore it doesn't matter how you live. Uh -oh. yeah. Now are we saved by grace? Yes. No. yes. But does it matter how we live? Oh yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. But do we hear out there, I'm saved, I believe in Christ and I'm saved by grace. While so I can live like the devil. While they're cursing and drinking and going out and womanizing, but I'm saved. <laughs> so the Nicolaitan said that by faith in Jesus Christ, the spirit of a person is saved. But since the well, you are bound by the flesh in which evil is present, you will always remain a sinner and always keep sinning. Yeah. And then <clears throat> the Nicolaitans, um, it says here that... Um, well, they turned grace, the grace of God into lasciviousness. And also the doctrine is now largely taught that the gospel of Christ was, ma was made the law of God of no effect. That by believing we are released from the necessity of being doers of the word. So it's, it, they, both, they both basically believe the same thing. And we see that a lot in our world today. So let's keep going. But she functions as a forerunner of the great harlot of Babylon, who will at the time of the end seduce the leaders of the world into the service of Satan. Are there leaders in our world today who we can see have been seduced by Satan? <clears throat> in Revelation 17, and there came one of the seven angels which had seven vials and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sits on many wa uh, sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have made drunk with the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Now what do we know about wine? What is wine? Mm -hmm. It's a dry. What is the wine? It's doctrine. That's exactly the wine of the wrath. So they've been made drunk with the doctrine of her fornication. This is dangerous. Yeah. Any, any, any doctrine, any influence in church is wrong. It's not in the right path. It's, it's yeah. wine. Yeah. So he can, every, every bit of doctrine that is not really truthful is a glass of wine. Yeah. So slowly, we're heading that way. I mean, like, either true music, either the way we dress, the way things. Well, there are those who are, and there, there are those who aren't. But anyway, we need to keep moving. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman on a scarlet-colored scarlet beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet colors. Now, what does purple represent? Royalty. Royalty. So this was a royalty, which means that they had political ambitions, and scarlet, what? Religious. Religious. Well, actually, it's persecution type things. But he's talking about a woman. So a woman is always a church, right? Right. So this is a rich church that has political aspirations and is willing to put people to death. It's decked with gold, which means it's rich, it, it precious stones, pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of the abominations and filthiness of her fornication. Upon her head was written the name Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, and abomination of the earth. And I saw a woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus Christ, and I saw her and I wondered with great admiration. I was just curious. I've got a, I, I decided to Google and see churches that use the golden cup and here's a picture that that showed up for me that's yeah. right that's right <laughs> and, 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 and you know Barbara for me it's significant that Christ brings in this church Jezebel because she is representative of a church mm -hmm. female woman church mm -hmm. and she describes the condition of the church to Jezebel 
very well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and if you go back on, she is the mother of Harlot, so she's got children just like her. Exactly. Yeah, she's got her children. And we're going to get into that in a bit. And the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and the beast that carrieth her, carrieth her which hath the seven heads and ten horns. All those who condone her teachings are committing spiritual adultery. We see this in Revelation 2.22. Right. Since harlots' activities take place in bed, the bed is the place where Jezebel and those who are in adulterous relationships with her will be judged. They, if they do not repent, Jesus will throw them together into the great affliction. A similar fate will come to Jezebel's offspring who will follow in her footsteps. By using this severe language, Jesus wants to impress upon their minds the seriousness of their actions. <clears throat> in Genesis 4, 1 and 19, 5, we see the same thing this whole, this whole issues of knowing them. <clears throat> because usually, did I? You skipped a slide. I skipped the slide. Let me, yeah. let me back up. So everyone, I skipped the slide. Sorry about that. Everyone who will be judged according to their works, not all members of the church have sided with Jezebel. So we need to know that. There is a remnant that has not known the deep things of Satan. Jezebel offers the members arcane teachings. However, her teachings are diabolically deep. In the Old Testament, the word to know denotes an experiential knowledge. Yeah. It's not just knowing, it's an experiential knowledge. So they've experienced it. And as such, it's used for sexual relations. Genesis 4, 1 and 19.5 says, And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain. So we see this issue of knowing brings forth a child. And in 19.5, uh, the, the story of Lot, remember when the men came, the angels came to Lot to have him leave, and, and everybody came to the door and said to him, where are the men which came in to see thee? Bring them out to us that we may know them. And so that shows, too, what they wanted to do with these men. This remnant is not involved in spiritual adultery with Jezebel to experience the depth of Satan's deceptive teaching. Jesus promises not to place upon them additional burdens and instead tells them to hold fast to what they have received thus far. To the ones who remain faithful in Thyatira, Jesus promises a share of his victory. He will give them authority over the nations just as he received authority from his father. So he's giving, he's, he's sharing that authority with them. He will also give them the morning star, which is a symbol of who? Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ, right. And I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you of these, thing, of these things in the church. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. Amen. Those who remain faithful, Jesus promises the greatest gift, the gift of himself. The situation in the church in Thyatira aptly applies to the condition of the church in the Middle Ages or the Dark Ages. The danger of the church did not come from outside of the church, but inside from the uh, authority uh, from God. And so that's why... Even today, and what they had to do in those, those days, they had to know their Bibles for themselves. Because we, we can't look to pastors, we can't look to elders, we can't look to anybody but the Word of God Amen. For, for our answers. And so we need to know what... It's, not, it's okay to have teachers and, and guidance, but you really... It, when you see something that doesn't quite make sense, you want to make sure you search it out. Yes. So in those days also, there was something, since the church kind of ruled universally, you could be excommunicated. Mm -hmm. If you're excommunicated, that meant nobody could have anything to do with you. You couldn't buy or sell. You, could, you had to be completely self-sufficient on your own. Yeah, be away from them. That's what... Um, 
No one could have any interaction with you. Otherwise, they would be excommunicated. Well, we're moving into that era. In fact, we're in that era, and it's it's already happening, and we're we're seeing it um, throughout the world. If you pay attention, if you're paying attention, you're seeing these things happen. If you're not going along with the narrative, your bank accounts bank accounts have been shut off. We've seen that this this last two years. We've seen people lose their jobs if they don't go with the program. There's been a lot of a, a lot of things have happened in the name of whatever that has, has been affecting people. So this is coming, this is gonna become more and more and more frequent. That's good, that means Jesus is coming. That means he's almost here, that's right. So during that period, tradition completely replaced the Bible with the basis of teaching and belief. So it all came about tradition. And, and that's one of the things that, that we really have to watch out for that it's tradition and not fundamental belief. Mm -hmm. A human priesthood and sacred relics replaced Christ's priesthood and works were regarded as a means of salvation. Now, we still struggle today, even us, even me as I stand here, struggle with this issue of salvation by works because we somehow we think our works are going to save us. We're not going to be saved if our works are bad, but it isn't just our works that save us. Those who did, who did not condone the corrupting influences of the institutional church experienced severe persecution and even death. <clears throat> These are some of the things that happened during the Dark Ages on this next slide. And I'm going to go through it really quick. You've got it in your, your, your um, notes. notes. Yeah. And this goes a little bit past the Dark Ages. But we had, in, in 607 was the first pope. 709, they started kissing the pope's feet. Uh, in 789, they started worshiping holy images and relics. See, these things weren't always here. They started during these time periods. The use of holy water began. Canonization of dead saints began. Fasting on Fridays during Lent. You know why they started the fasting on Fridays? Or there's that fish, no, a fish on Fridays. The fish on Fridays. The fish on Fridays was because the the fishermen weren't making enough money, so they had them. So they had them um, buy, made them buy fish on 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 Fridays. Um, <clears throat> celibacy of the priesthood. That was a thousand A.D. Yeah. Prayer beads. Where do prayer beads? Where do we see prayer beads? Buddhism. Buddhism. Muslim. Muslim. Just about every other religion has prayer beads, don't they? Uh, the Inquisition, and that was a that was a lot of of, of godly people died for that. Sure. The sale of indulgences. This is one of the things that upset Martin Luther the most was the sale of indulgence mm -hmm. indulgences. Transubstantiation. Do we know what that is? It's it's the literal blood and body of Christ. Flesh, flesh, animal, blood. Flesh, <laughs> yeah. Animal. Um, adoration of the host, the forbidden, the Bible was forbidden for lay people. Yep. Mm -hmm. This is part of the reason it was the Dark Ages, is because they weren't allowed to read their Bibles. And then um, the, the forbidden, I read that there. Purgatory came about in about 1400s. Um, the doctrine of the seven sacraments were affirmed. Ava Maria was approved. So Maria, Mary, became a, a big issue. Uh, the, and I'm going to stop here. The, Jesu, the Jesuit order was founded. Right. So the Jesuit orders was founded just about the time of the end of the Reformation. And it was vital in the persecution that the church entertained with that order. The, the Jesuit order was big in the Counter-Reformation. That's, that's correct. Yeah, they were big in the Counter-Reformation. So they didn't come up with the Immaculate Conception of Mary until 1854. Yeah. Yeah. And that was all because, well, she had to be special to give birth to Christ, so she was immaculately conceived then, so she could be pure. So when, how, how far back does the Bible go? Well, yeah. Well, exactly. And how, how, when did these, when did these um, doctrines show up? Much more after. Much after the Bible. Exactly. 
No excuses. Yeah. So, so we, we, we see this happening through what the Dark Ages. What's the significance of with that? Hmm? What's the significance of being Bibles forbidden and to that tradition or to the immaculate conception of man? If you don't know something oh, and you have to go to another person to find out what that is, you can tell them anything you want to tell them. Right, right. The infallibility of the Pope declared. So yeah. there's no guidance. Yeah, there's, there's no... Everything comes from what you're told. And what, what, what they were being told was that the priests are the only one who have that knowledge of what the Bible has to say. You, you don't. It's the, it's the priests who do. So then they would go to the priests to find out what that knowledge was. They would say the Bible is far too complex to understand for a simple mind like yours, so leave it to us to explain it to you. Mm -hmm. So this is their doctrine. Yeah. Yeah. These are these are part. These are things that can't showed up in their doctrine. So was there a Bible believing church during this time period? Oh, yes. absolutely. There were a few. Yeah. But I'm going to just bring up one of them because it's probably the most famous. Yep. And that's the Waldenses. Yes. The Waldenses. Okay. And what a beautiful place to visit. Yes, it was beautiful. These, this group of people, yeah, the, this, <laughs> everybody's excited. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad. So anyway, these, this group of people had portions of Bible. They may only have a chapter. They may only have a New Testament. They might only have a portion of the no, Old Testament. But they would take and rewrite these scriptures by hand. And they would take and sew them in their clothes. They were all merchants. And they would go from town to town selling their wares. And if they came across somebody they thought was interested in, in Christ, they would take this out and share it with them out of their clothing. Now, did they make mistakes? Yes. Did many die for it? Yes. But that's why God says that this, the, the, his followers were rich in faith. Because no matter what was coming down on their heads, they were going to share Christ with, with anyone who would listen. And so this was a, a very important time for the church. And this is why they're told that they are rich in faith, is because of this. Hey, guys. <clears throat> So, now, the next church, that's Thyatira. So we're going to come out of the Dark Ages now, and we're going to move into Sardis. And this is about 1500 to 1750, which was kind of the time of the Reformation. Right. So we're going to talk about this, this whole Reformation kind of thing throughout the book of Sardis. Does somebody else want to read for me? I think Danielle read last time. Can I get another reader for Revelation 3, 1 through 6? Byron, go ahead. And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God, and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest, and art dead. Be watchful, and strengthen the things which remain, that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard, and hold fast, and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Thou hadst a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. So we have a group of people on this earth that have just come out of six, 1260 years of not being able to read the Bible for themselves unless it was in hiding. And so this is the, this is the era, church era, we're looking at right now. <laughs> 
So here's what the um, SDA Bible commentary says about the, the Church of Sardis. The city of Sardis first appears in history as the capital of the Lydian kingdom in the 7th century BC. The earliest city had lain entirely within the strong protective walls of the Acropolis Hill, but later expanded into the plain in its foothill. It was here about this time that coins were invented. So this is where our money came from, you guys. And used as money for the first time in history. The Lydian gained the honor of making an invention of lasting and worldwide importance. Sardis was conquered by Cyrus the Great and became the proud and rich capital of the kingdom um, and home to many of the Lydian and Persian kings. <clears throat> so back to our book now. Sardis was built on a steep hill, we talked about that, overlooking the fertile valley. Because the platform of the hill upon which the city stood eventually became too small, it moved, it moved out to the valley. The city had a splendid history. Some six centuries prior to the writing of the Book of Revelation, Sardis had been one of the greatest cities of the ancient world. It was the capital of uh, there, and as we just talked about, Cyrus <coughs> the Great um, um, really liked this city. By the Roman period, the city had lost its prestige. <clears throat> While continuing to enjoy prosperity and wealth, the city's glory and pride was rooted in its past rather than its present reality. So it was great. It lost its greatness. The city was known as a trading center for wool, dyeing, and garment making industries, providing the citizens with a luxurious lifestyle. The largest building in the city was the Temple of Artemis. They always had their pagan temples. <clears throat> The city's patron deity was Sibel, I'm not sure I'm saying that, who was the mother of the gods. One of the things I wanted to stop here and mention, every single time period had their, their gods. I think the Greek period was the biggest pantheon of gods out there. But they had their, their gods. There was always a mother, a father, and a child, and there was always sun worship involved with, with these. So, you may want to keep that in mind. Um, anyway, her temple was hosted by eunuch priests. The goddess was believed to possess special power of restoring the dead to life. Due to its location on a partially steep hill, the city was a natural citadel, inaccessible except by one route, and as such was easy to defend. Because of this, the citizens became so arrogant and overconfident that the city walls were carelessly guarded or not guarded at all. The city was captured by surprise on two occasions, first by Cyrus in 549 and then by Antiochus III in uh, 218. On both occasions, enemy soldiers climbed the precipice by night and found that the Sardinians had not posted guards on the walls. The city was taken and destroyed because of overconfidence of its citizen and its failure to guard and keep watch. This is really spiritually significant as we get into um, to talking about this. So Jesus' message to the church, Jesus introduced himself as the one who has the seven spirits of God and seven stars. Now we studied this, what were the seven spirits? The, 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 the angels of God's seven churches? No, no, no. The seven no. spirits. The, spirit. the Holy Spirit in its fullness. The Holy Spirit and in its fullness. comes to this church <coughs> in full spirit. In full spirit. Right. Seven is perfection, yeah. right? God's perfection or completeness. Right. And um, the Spirit is the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And the seven stars. Now you can... The church. The seven the church. No, the seven angels. These are the angels. So what we see is the angels and the Holy Spirit here in the beginning of this. Revelation 3, 1, the angel of the church of Sardis write these things, the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. He says, I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest and art dead. The church, and that's interesting that the goddess they had was able to raise the dead, isn't it? The church is about to receive a strong rebuke from Christ. However, Jesus comes to it 
with the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Awake this lifeless church and bring it back to life. So this was a period where he was trying to bring the church back to life. Romans 8, 11 says, But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead will also quicken your mortal bodies by the spirit that dwells in you. So it's important that the Holy Spirit was there to dwell in these, these, uh, these, this church group. The tone that Jesus uses to address the church is alarming from the start. The church is not in condemned for inequalities. I think it says on your, I think all it says on, on, the, on the, the grid is they were, a few were not defiled. But he doesn't really, um, he doesn't really um, give them any, any uh, commendations. Jesus knows their works and their realities, their real spiritual condition. The church has a name to be alive, but in reality, it has reached the point of spiritual death. And it would, because for 1260 years, they, hadn't, they didn't have the Bible for the most part. The situation in the church reflects the characteristics of the city itself. Based on their history, they had a great reputation to be alive, but in the present, they were lifeless. Their works do not measure up to God's standards. I have not found your works fulfilled before my God, says the Revelation 3.2. Their deeds were lacking the transforming power of the gospel. <clears throat> they were not blamed for specific sins or heresy, but for being lifeless. So do we have a lifeless church or do we have a life-filled church? That's the question. Is that worse than uh, Luke 1? No, not yet. Their problem was their spiritual complacency and lethargy. Exactly. And that's, that's, a, that's something that we have to guard against ourselves, too. That, that creates compromise. Yeah. That's really the problem. Yeah, their compromise with pagan environment had killed their spiritual life and their witnesses to the gospel. Jesus exhorts them to keep and watch, keep watch and strengthen those who have some life in themselves but are ready to die. As with the church in Ephesus, Jesus exhorts the Sardinians to remember how they heard and received the gospel in the beginning of their Christian experience. The only way to reclaim a wholehearted devotion to Christ is to recall and keep past experience fresh in their mind and apply it to the present. So we want to remember those times that God has, has been with us, those strong times in our lives. This will result in repentance and turning away from their present lethargic conditions to a new beginning in their relationship with Christ. In such a way, their love and devotion to Christ will be rekindled by the life-giving Spirit of God. However, if they do not wake up and repent, Jesus will come to them in judgment unexpectedly like a thief in the night. Now, we see this thief in the night. Christ is going to come like a thief in the night, isn't he? And that really means what? He'll come when they least expect it. Yeah. You see, you, you see Barbara, from, from my particular perspective, this is so significant for us today, as far as the Sardis, the condition of the Sardis church. When you take away God's word, mm -hmm. at that time, that was the case. Yeah. Or when I ignore God's word in my time, because that's, there's so many Bibles available, that it's not an excuse, yeah. then I will, um, I, I will go into complacency, lethargy, and eventually compromise. Yeah. There's no other, no other way. So this whole concept of watchfulness is a characteristic of a faithful Christian. Right. Now, my poor elders that I, I work with, I, I had an elders meeting where they had to sit and listen to about being watchmen on the gate for about, what, two or three hours? <laughs> See, Nick's laughing back there. <laughs> so Revelation 16, 15 says, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and see his shame. Ezekiel 33, 2 and 6 says, Son of man, speak to the, the children of thy people and say to them, 
When I bring a sword upon the land, if the people of the land take man of their coast and set for them a watchman but if the watchman sees the sword come and blows not the trumpet the, and the people are not warned if the sword come and take any person from among them he is taken away in his iniquity so that's we have to be careful of that but he says his blood i will require at the watchman's hand so we are responsible for our neighbors because if we know something's coming and something's going to happen and we don't tell our fellow man, then there he requires um, his blood at the watchman's hand. If the church fails to watch its destiny, it will mirror the history of this city. Justice Sardis was unexpectedly conquered two times due to the citizens' lack of vigilance, so Christ will visit judgment on the unexpected like a thief in their spiritual lethargy. So it's important for us to be watchful and to share the, those things that we know. Amen. Because if that happens, it will be too late to repent for everyone. However, there are still some Christians in Sardis who were unwavering in their faithfulness to Christ. These members have not defiled their clothes by compromise with paganism. We see that in 3.4. They were a minority in the church, though, and even they were in danger of dying. Jesus promises that they will walk with him in white robes. Now, this white robe is important. We'll talk about that right now. Because if they're in white robes, that means they're worthy. The white robes that they will receive correspond with their faithfulness to Christ. So white robes equals what? Christ's righteousness. Yes, his, the, the, the faithfulness to Christ. Right. Jesus promises the overcomers in the church that they will be clothed with white raiment. This is reaffirms his promises in, in several verses. Those who keep their garments undefiled, either from pagan environment or the lethargic situation of the church, will walk with Jesus in white robes. The fulfillment of this promise is described in Revelation 7, 13, and 14, where we, this is a scene in heaven where one of the elders says, he answered me saying, what are these which are arrayed, arrayed in white robes? And when, and when did they come? And I said to them, sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, these are they which came out of great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they before the, they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple, that he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. Now, when, this, when it talks about washing their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb, that has a very interesting sanctuary significance and a temple significance in, in, in sanctuary language. Because at the end of, um, of the Day of Atonement, when they put the blood on the scapegoat, they also dip the cord in blood and they put it on the door of the sanctuary. And when the, the scapegoat was taken out to the wilderness and was left to die, when that happened and God had, had accepted their sacrifice, that bloody cord on the sanctuary turned white. And so that happened up until... Uh, Christ's crucifixion. After that, when they did it, the, the, the cord didn't turn white any longer. So it's... So what do we do now to be white, to have the white garment? Well, that means we have to wash our robes white in the blood of the Lamb. That means that we have to have a, a relationship with Jesus where we're having our sins forgiven, where we are, are coming to Him, where we're persevering. So washing our, our robes white really means trying to get the sin out of our lives, right? And repenting for what you have. Yeah. So Jesus promises that the overcomers of the church 
And these, when you overcome, it means you get over something, right? When you overcome something, you get over something. And in the church, that they will be clothed with white garments. This reaffirms the promise made in the previous verse. Those who keep their garments undefiled, either from pagan environment or the lethargic situation in the church, will walk with Jesus in white robes. The, the fulfillment of the promise is described. We've, we, oh, we read that, didn't we? I read it again. Sorry. Jesus also promises not to erase their names from the book of life, but to confess their names before the Father and his angels. Amen. Now, there, is, there are some theories out there about once saved, always saved. And this would kind of go against that concept, wouldn't it? Yeah. He's saying, I won't take your names out of the book of life. If he could take your names out of the book of life, that means it's possible to do so, doesn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if we think about <laughs> some people in the Bible that were with God and walked away from God, there's one in the Old Testament that comes to me really quickly and one in the New Testament. What are your thoughts? Who is that? Samuel's replacement. Saul. Saul? Uh -huh. In the Old Testament. In the Old Testament. What about Judas? Judas was Wasn't Judas one of Christ's disciples? In the New Testament. Yeah, wasn't he with Christ the whole time? Yeah, Judas was in the New Testament. Yeah, but what happened to Judas? He he didn't repent, and he, he, he left. So, so there is this concept of being able to have our names taken out of the book of life. This echoes the words Jesus spoke to his disciples. Everyone who confesses me before men will I confess before my Father who is in heaven. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess before my Father which is in heaven. The message to the church of Sardis fits appropriately with the condition of the church of the post-Reformation period known as the Protestant scholasticism or the Protestant Reformation. The vibrant generation of reformers rediscovered the gospel forgotten during the medieval period and put the Bible in the hands of people. New churches were established. Christianity became rejuvenated. Sadly, once the reformers passed away, the lifeless formalism began. Their successors became more and more involved in doctrinal polemics. So they all started fighting over doctrine. What's truth? And that has gone on till today, for sure. <clears throat> and controversies gradually degenerating into a state of spiritual lethargy. Toward the end of the period, every, every, under the impact of the rising tide of philosophical rationalism, 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 we can rationalize everything, can't we? I can, I can. I can rationalize everything I do. What? It's a great justification for sin. It is. Mm -hmm. Rationalism and secularism. So it's the getting involved in that, being, being involved. Self-glorification. Yeah. The saving grace of the gospel and commitment to Christ waned, giving place to, oh, I said that, the church during this period although appearing to be alive, was in reality spiritually dead. So this was the time of, of, of the Reformation. This was, the, the, the most famous reformer was who? Luther. Martin Luther. Probably, yeah. Yeah, and he, he was uh, righteousness by faith. Yes. And he was also, he says the just shall live by faith. Yes. He was also big against the indulgences. Correct. To having to buy your way out of sin. He was and, really big against that. And Barbara, I think, I think perhaps one of the principal um, proponents of, of the Reformation was the printing of the Bible and the availability of God's Word. Yeah. That was very important. Yeah, this, this, was, this was important. Yeah. Yeah, this, this came out of the, this was coming out of the Dark Ages about... <laughs> I think it was about was it about 1400. I think yes. the Bible, the printing press, yep. was was uh, was founded. This yep. next one is very busy, but basically what I want you to get from this is the Protestantism took off, and we had two main folks. There's a Henry the Eighth, 
He took off and went one direction, and Luther went off and went another direction. And so that is why we have so many churches today. They would come up with, they would fight over a doctrine, and they would come up with a doctrine that they would hang on to, and that would be the basis for starting the church. But we have to thank these reformers, because these reformers were not the people from like the Waldenses who were out sharing the Bible. Right. This came from within the church itself. Right. So just as the church went into the dark ages and, and lost Christ in coming out, and this is why Sardis, <laughs> towards the end, grew in faith, because from within, they, they brought Christ back. Which so which? William, Miller, William Miller there was Adventist? Like, that was in the eight. That's that's in the 1800s, no, though. The 1800s. But during that time, the the, the stimulation of, of of Bible learning was such that it caused a lot of uh, a lot of reformation, a lot of different uh, different philosophies and principles in different churches. Around. That's exactly right. And Philadelphia then takes off and takes us to a whole new level. Uh, the Church of Philadelphia. And uh, I need one, a new reader here for uh, 7 through 13. George, let's go. Let's go, George. <laughs> Jill, you want to put the scripture up for him? Where she, he's going to put it up so you can read it. Oh, we've lost our... Oh. It's also in the bar. Oh, God. Seven. Seven. So let's just hold on. Yeah. 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 Okay. So they found that. <laughs> You guys have a Bible back there? So they, yeah, they yeah, have the, Go ahead and read for me. Well, they have the print copy, so they can yeah, the print copy. Yeah, the book too. Go ahead. Right. Ready, right. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, write these things says that is holy. He that is true. He that he that the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. I know thy works, behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it, for thou hast a little thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not divided, denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not. But do lie, but do lie, well, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. Next. Thank you. Seven. He's only read one. Okay, keep going. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I, will, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world, to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man may take thy crown. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of, the, of, name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. He that, he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the church. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Good job. Amen. So I just want to make sure that when we say, when the Bible says here, what does that mean? 
When he says here. Yeah, yeah he'll he that let him hear let him let has an ear, let him hear. Listen. But does that mean it, you hear it and it sits right here? <laughs> does it get stuck here in the middle somewhere? It's supposed to come out in actions and words and deeds. So it's a verb, huh? As I say, it depends on the person. Right? <laughs> no. So the city of Philadelphia was the youngest of the seven cities. It was situated on a high volcanic plateau in the mountains, mountainous regions, making it a strong fortress city. The city was founded by a talus of, I can't even pronounce his name. Yeah, in, in 159 BC, the king of Pergamum, who named the city Philadelphia, or brotherly love, Philadelphia means brotherly love, for the love he had for his brother. When Emenius ascended to the throne, Attalus served him faithfully as an army general in spite of his power and many opportunities to throw him, overthrow him. Only after the death of his brother did he occupy the throne. So Jesus presents him. Skip slide. Philadelphia was a prosperous city that stood on the imperial trade road, connecting all parts of the east with parts of the west of the province. It also stood on a major postal road running from Pergamum to Laodicea. From its inception, Philadelphia was intended to serve as a missionary city for promoting the Greek language and culture in areas of Lydia and, and um, Phrygia. It, its geographic location, however, made it subject to occasional earthquakes. The most severe one took place in AD 17 and devastated Philadelphia, Sardis, and other surrounding cities. It was rebuilt by the Romans, Emperor Tiberius. <clears throat> Jesus presented himself as the holy and true one who holds the key of David. This holding the key of David, we're going to talk about it a little bit tonight, but we're also going to talk about it more in an upcoming lesson because this whole key of David thing is, has um, a lot of significance. Um, the Holy One is a reference to God in the Old Testament. Isaiah 43, 15 says, I am the Lord, your Holy One. Isaiah 57, 15 says, whose name is holy. And then Habakkuk 3 says, God came from Teman and the Holy One from Mount Paran, Selah. His glory covered the heavens and earth was full of praise. Now, I didn't understand quite what this Teman meant. And I, I looked it up and it's basically meaning coming from the east. Where does Christ come from? East. 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 He comes from the east, doesn't he? East. So this is, <laughs> yeah. So... Um, they're really talking about Christ coming from the East as the Holy One. In the New Testament, it also designates Jesus. Uh, Mark 1.24, we see them saying that Jesus is Nazareth, Nazareth is the Holy One of God. John 6.69, 6, uh, the true one. That it's the Son of God, the living God. Jesus is also the true one. Revelation 3.14, and the angel of the church of Laodiceans write, these things say the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. So we see that God is true, holy, faithful, the true witness. Revelation 19.11 says, and I saw heaven opened, and I behold a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. So we're seeing this throughout the Bible as a, 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 a description thank you description of Jesus, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. He has the key of David. Right. When he opens, no one can shut, and when he shuts, no one is able to open. So this is saying that Jesus has full control. He has full authority, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. Isaiah 22, 22 says, And the key of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulders. 
So he shall open and none shall shut, and he shall shut and none shall open. And uh, Jesus thus presents himself to the church as the one with full authority and access to the heavenly storehouse. Thus, this is why he is able to make those great promises to the church of Sardis. In contrast to Sardis, which does not receive any praise from Jesus, the church of Philadelphia does not receive any rebuke. Yeah. So <clears throat> the, the, the Philadelphia church does such a great job that they do not get rebuked. Jesus knows their works. They have kept the word and did not deny it. Like the Sumerians, they suffer from Jewish opposition. Even though these Jews say they, are, they serve God, they did not. They were actually the synagogue of Satan. That's, what, that's a term God uses for those who don't, who pretend to be his people and don't serve him. Because they have kept the words of Jesus, endurance consistently before their eyes, Jesus promises to preserve them during the time of severe trial that is to come upon those who dwell on the earth. So because they're doing God's work, they're going to be pr protected from severe trial. That's quite a promise and quite a blessing. Those who dwell on the earth in Revelation is a regular reference to the wicked. Those who dwell on the earth re refers to the wicked. This time of trial to come upon the wicked involves the seven last plagues, which God will pour upon those who receive the mark of the beast. We see those in chapters 15 and 16, which we'll be studying in the future. Jesus promises to be with his faithful people and to protect them during the time of trial. Jesus is coming soon, and he exhorts the Philadelphians to hold fast to what they have so no one can take their crown of victory. So whatever it is that these, the, 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 the Philadelphians, and it's, it's interesting that they're called the brotherly love. So what they're doing has, has a huge love component in it for God and one another. And so... He's telling them to hang on to that crown, that crown of victory. Although weak, they must hold fast to what they have. The spark of their faithfulness, that is still burning. If they do, neither Satan nor humans will be able to take the crown that is reserved for them. Those who overcome are promised to be permanent pillars in the temple of New Jerusalem with, with the names of God. The New Jerusalem and Christ written on them. Pillars in the earthly temple provided stability and permanence. So the pillars in the temple is really kind of what held the temple together. They are a symbol of the church in the New Testament. First Timothy 1 or 3.15 says, But if I tarry long, that they now it mayest know that thou oughtst to have thyself in the house of God which is the church of the living God, the pillar, and the ground of truth. So these pillars are the saints, aren't they? They're the, they're the ones who, who are really standing for God. The faithful are promised that they will always be in God's presence. They will serve God in his temple. Therefore, are they, before the throne, therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple, he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. The situation of the Church of Philadelphia coincided with the situation in Christianity during the 18th and 19th centuries. This period was char characterized by a great revival in Protestantism. There was a huge revival during this time. A lot of, a lot of different things happened. This comes right up to what, what was the time period here on <coughs> Philadelphia? 1750 to, to 1850. So 1750 to 1850. Yeah. I remember 1844 is in it. I know, we're going to get to that in a second. Go ahead. Right. Yeah, so is this uh, the Philadelphia church, are they Sabbath people? Are they what? Sabbath. 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 Yeah. Some, were, some, some were and some weren't. Some were not. Some were not because it's, it starts at 1750. Well, there, there, was, there have been Sabbath keepers all through time. Yeah. There has never been a time in this earth history where there haven't been Sabbath keepers. 
The Jews were Sabbath keepers. We see through the different different times in the church of the Dark Ages, we had the Waldensians. Uh, the Irish, I believe, yeah, right? The there's Irish Irish. Saint Patrick. The so it's St. Patrick, the Celtics. So there have been Sabbath keepers through every church. Right. Um, that, that has not ever gone away. Absolutely right. Yeah. <clears throat> so, okay. Various movements, thank you. I get to talking to you guys and I lose my place. Various movements revitalized genuine faith and the saving grace of Christ, and that resulted in a restoration of spirit of Christian fellowship and self sacrifice. The church during this period was driven by a genuine desire to carry the gospel to the whole world. As a result, there was a great uh, propagation of the gospel that had never before been experienced. So this is interesting that this, this is the church that is given credit for something that Christ told everybody to do at the beginning. What was that? It was the only job description he ever gave the church. What was that? Go. Go and, and make disciples and baptize. So something really interesting happened during this time period. And this was about um, the 1700s. Actually, there was a young country girl by the name of Mary Jones. Oh, you go to Ireland. Mm -hmm. Yes, and she was in Wales. This young girl learned to read in her Sunday school and dreamed of having a Bible in Welch. Amen. At the age of 15, after having sent money aside, now this was a poor girl. It took her six years to put enough money together to even think about going to buy a Bible. She set out and walked over 40 kilometers to Bala. This is her walking. What is she wearing? Nothing. Nothing. She's barefoot, isn't she? Um, where she hoped to buy when she did indeed get her Bible. And, it's, and as the story goes, it wasn't the easiest time for her to get this Bible because she went there and they had just sold the last Bible. And so she couldn't buy a Bible, but the, the pastor was so impressed. This gentleman by the name of Charles Thomas, he made sure she had a Bible before she left. So he was so impressed by her determination and suddenly realized that there was a great shortage of Bibles and that millions of people could not afford to have a copy. He went to London where he mobilized a large number of like-minded people. This is, was the beginning of the first Bible society. Amen. Now these Bible societies took off Amen. and grew and grew and grew and grew. In fact, <clears throat> some of you who are older, like me, Remember times of going to a hotel and you couldn't go into a hotel without find a Gideon, finding a Gideon Bible in the drawer. Not so much that way today, but back in the day, um, you you that you couldn't you couldn't even go anywhere without finding the Bible. And so the Bible now, anyone has a Bible. How many of us have Bibles here? How many of us have cell phones? <laughs> so, I know you still like your you still like your Bible. The other thing that happened during this time period in the huh? We have a collection of Bible. Yeah, probably close to. I shouldn't say. It's okay. It's okay as long as you're reading them. But if they sit on the shelf and collect dust, they're not helping anybody. So, the other thing that happened right at, at the end of, of this period, in the, the late 18, uh, or the early 1800s, the 40s and, and just before, was a movement, and it was a movement that was really a worldwide movement. They had figured out Daniel's prophecy of the 2300 days, and they knew it was coming to an end. 
and they were trying to figure out what that meant because that he, they said that the sanctuary would be cleansed. So they really believed that at that point in time, it meant Christ was coming back. And as we know, 1844 came and went, and Christ didn't come back. But something happened. And those of us who study our sanctuary, what do we know about the festivals of the, of the sanctuary? What is the sixth what is the sixth festival? Yom Kippur. And we know that that's the holiest day of the Lord, isn't it? The holiest day of the Lord, and they know that it is a time of what? Making right with God's Judgment. Didn't, didn't they all hold their breath when the priest went into the most holy place? Because if he'd gone in to the holy place with any sins, sin in the camp, what would happen? Yeah, yeah a big sizzle fits, huh? Yeah. And so... Huh? They tied a rope to him so they could pull his body. That's exactly They would. They'd pull him out. And so we see that... We see that... Um, that was the sixth... That was the sixth festival. What was the seventh festival? The, the festival of what? No, that was the sixth was the Day of Atonement. What was the seventh? The Feast of Trumpets? No, Booths. Booths. The Feast of Booths. What did the Feast of Booths represent? It's the harvest and the The Feast of Booths is dwelling with God. It's a celebration of, it's a celebration. So, yeah. So the cleansing of the sanctuary was the sixth festival. It wasn't the seventh. So that was where the confusion fell. The seventh was dwelling with Christ. Correct. Which was the second coming. That's the second coming. Correct. That's Very where good. It's the Feast of Booths. That's where it's we're the Feast of Booths. Celebrating with Christ. We're celebrating with Christ. And if any of you have seen the, these, this whole issue with the Festival of Booths, they make these beautiful booths. Yeah. They cover them with, with palms and grapes and flowers, and, and they spend a week together, together outside dwelling with, dwelling with God. Remember at the um, Mount of Transfiguration, what did the disciples want to do? They want to build the trees there too. Yeah, they wanted to build booths, didn't they? Right. So they could the so so they could have this concept of dwelling. So now we're coming to the final church, which is Laodicea. Laodicea. So who wants to read Revelation three fourteen through twenty two? Moses. Uh, 14. And after the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, Laodiceans write, These things uh, thank the Amen and the faithful and true witness of the beginning of creation of God. I know they works that they are neither cold nor hot. I would thou work cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold or hot, I will speak. Keep them out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increase of the good, and have nothing, I have need of nothing. And the notes have that though are correct, miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. 18. I counsel thee to buy of me a gold tried in the fire, and that thou mayest be rich, and the white remnant that thou mayest be loved, and that the shame of thy neighbor. Nakedness do not appear, and anoint thy eyes with thy slave. That thy mayest see, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come and do, and will step him up, and he will be. Amen. One, two more. One, two more, two more verses. Three, four, number twenty-one. To him to overcome this, 
I will grant to sit with me in the room. Even I also overcome, and I am set, set down to my Father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith says unto the churches. Thank you. Thank you. So, why is this exciting? Why is Laodicea exciting? I get excited about it. It's the last church. It's the last church. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be brave enough. I, I wasn't going to say anything. Because the Lord is saying to a certain extent, when you, when you look at culture, and when we look at the, uh, particularly culture and, and economics or the economy, that is very similar to the United States of America and Western Europe. It is. It really is. But Laodicea is exciting because it's the time we're living oh, in that's exactly this this is our church guys so <laughs> huh? people. people's character yeah spiritual and when those who overcome the exciting part of overcoming in laodicea is we get to what sit on the throne with jesus we get to sit on the throne yeah does any other church get that promise nope. no there's going to be pillars but not those who sit on his throne. So the last seven messages was addressed to the church of Laodicea and is in modern um, Turkey, located some 45 miles southeast of Philadelphia and 100 miles east of Samaria. The city of Laodicea is situated in the Lycus Valley on the major trade road between Ephesus and Syria and near the cities of Heropolis and Colossa. Who founded churches in Heropolis and Colossa? Paul. Paul. So, see, these are cities. Remember we talked last week about God only picking seven cities even though there were more than seven churches? So we know that, that Paul started those cities. Because of its favorable location, the city became one of the greatest commercial financial centers of the ancient world. Like Victor said, are we here in the United States one of the major uh, financial centers of the world? So, so let me say something else that should be quiet, but this is the family. The problem with Lawadi Saya was water. They really had to transport water into the city. Part of the problem of the United States is the lack of water now. Yeah. yeah. And those of us in California should understand that. Yeah. Laodicea was enormously wealthy. Most of the wealth came from clothing manufacturing, industry, and banking. <laughs> Not that much different from today. Laodicea was widely known for the fine quality of soft, glossy back, black wool used for making different kinds of garments and carpets that were exported all over the world. This black wool was very, it was for the elite. It was, it was very expensive. The commercial prosperity made the city a great banking center where a large quantity of gold was stored. In addition, Laodicea was famous for its medical school, which had a reputation throughout the ancient world for its treatment of eye diseases right. by means of an ointment made from Pergian powder mixed with oil. And it's really interesting that Laodicea has this... That they're, they're blind and they're naked. They're blind. Exactly. And yet the city makes, makes a, a powder for them to see. Mm -hmm. the, the commercial and financial and industrial prosperity and success filled the wealthy citizens of Laodicea with spiritual pride. So they became very prideful. When it was devastated by an earthquake in AD 60, its citizens were so rich and filled with pride that according to the Roman historian Tactus, they proudly refused to, uh, imperial help and rebuilt the city using their own resources. The proud spirit of the city evidently pervaded the church. I am rich have become wealthy and have need of, of nothing. For all its prosperity, the, the, the city had a great problem with water, as Victor said. It, they, took, they had to build a six mile long aqueduct to supply the city 
with water from the vicinity of Heropolis and also received water from Colossa. Known for its cold mountain water, whether the water came <clears throat> from the hot springs of Heropolis or the cool water of Colossa, it became lukewarm in the aqueduct, and by the time it got to the city, the situation could have provided a background of the metaphoric warmness, lukewarmness of the Laodicean church. The church of La in Laodicea, Jesus presents himself with a threefold designation. The amen and faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. He talks about those three. Gen uh, Revelation 3.14, and the angel of the church of Laodicea write these things, saith the amen. We're going to look at who that amen is, the faithful and true witness. Isn't that Christ? We've, we just discussed that. The beginning of the creation of God. So was Christ there in the beginning? Yeah. Of creation? <laughs> Isaiah 55.16 says that he who blesseth himself in the earth shall bless himself in the God of truth. And he that sweareth in the earth shall swear by the God of truth, because the former troubles are forgotten, and because they, have, they are hid from mine eyes. Christ's discerning testimony exposes the true condition of this church. <clears throat> His creative power to bring something out of nothing is the only hope for this half-hearted and lukewarm yet loved by Christ's church. This church is in such bad condition that Jesus has nothing positive to say about it. How sad is that? <clears throat> our church, you guys, our church is so lukewarm, Jesus has nothing good to say about us. Wait, wait, I have to comment on that. There could be elements in this time that are not Laodicean. That's true. Hypothetically, they could be Samaritan or something like that. They could be. It could be Philadelphia. Yeah, could, they could be Philadelphia. But There's the some majority, who are Philadelphia. But yeah. the majority yeah. perhaps might be allowed to sin. Surprisingly, the, me the members are not charged with sin, apostasy, or heresy. Yet no other church receives such a stern rebuke. Jesus likens it to the city's water supply. The members are neither refreshingly cold, hot, but lukewarm. And as such, Jesus wants to vomit them out of his, his mouth. And it says, so then because thou art lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Now when he's talking about the spewing, this is more than spewing. It's more than vomiting. Correct. It's projectile vomiting. Correct. And if you've ever been around, and Correct. usually it's with the little kids, where they just let loose and it goes flying everywhere and you're cleaning up for... Projectile. Water. Lock clears. Yeah, it's for like it's not just like you, you know. It's not something. gentle. You're aiming. So, yeah. What is it? It just goes, and you can't control it. It's so bad you can't control it. Go ahead. When Jesus said, "I wish you are you are warm or hot, or, or cold or hot," cold. what does it mean? That well, he he said, "I can do something with you. If you're hot, if you're firm, and you're out there doing my work, we can work together." If you're cold, I know what to do with you, but you're neither. Well, what are we supposed to do? Yeah. And actually, that's the worst way to represent Christ, because if you have that laissez-faire lukewarmness, you're giving them a gospel message that leads to the wide and easy path. Mm -hmm. So you're literally leading people to destruction, not salvation. Yeah. So the church reflects the complacency of the very city that pride itself accomplished, its accomplishes and wealth. The members claim to be rich and have need of nothing. And as far as a church goes, we have, I mean, even if you look at Laguna and Niguel, we have a, a very prosperous church here financially, don't we? They regard their wealth as divine favor just as Ephraim did in the Old Testament. And it says, Surely I have become rich. I have found wealth for myself in all my labors. They will find in me no iniquity, which would be sin. And Hosea 12, 8 says, Ephraim said, I have become rich and have found in me 
found me out substance. In all my labors, they shall find no iniquity. So what we're, what we're saying is, because what we believe is because God is blessing us financially, that we don't have anything to worry about. So, so um, but he, yet he's saying we're lukewarm. In contrast to the Christians in Samaria, who are poor but are spiritually rich, the Laodiceans are wealthy, yet in reality are miserable and spiritually poor, blind, and naked. If we look at these different churches, as we look at the different churches, the ones who were the richest were the ones who really had the most persecution. If you look at the, the, the second church here, yeah. if you look at Smyrna, Smyrna took a beating, but yet they were the richest. They stood for God. They, they made a stand. They were hot. Yeah, their faith, their works, they were hot. But the Laodicean church has a little bit of both. They have a little bit of hot, a little bit of cold. For the most part, it's lukewarm. Is it because of the backsliding or what? I know it's lukewarm, but how did we... How did it well, it's because we don't think we need anything. We have it all. I mean, are we, are we struggling to, to live? Do we all have full bellies? If you're not dependent on God, if you depend on yourself, it seriously affects your faith. That's why Christ said it's easy or it's difficult for a rich man to enter into heaven like the eye of a needle because a rich man usually places his faith in his wealth and himself. If, if, if you look at the disciples, let's, let's, let's take a look at the disciples. How many of them died of old age? One. Maybe. Yeah. One. One. They, they all, John did. John did, but all of the rest of them died horrible deaths from persecution. The church of Smyrna, they were thrown to the lions. Polycarp was burned alive. You're right, Polycarp was burned alive. But they were spiritually rich. They were willing to take a stand for God. We see that with Daniel. When da Daniel took a stand for God. Remember growing up, they said we dare to be like Daniel? There's a song about that. Mm -hmm. But so God wants us as Laodiceans to be willing to take a stand for him. I mean, none of us, all of us tonight are going to go out of here. We're going to have, we're going to, we're going to curl up. We're going to go to sleep and we're going to come back to church tomorrow. We don't have to worry about, am I going to make it home because somebody's going to pick me up and put me in jail. You know, Barbara, the, 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 the problem with them was the condition of the heart. Mm -hmm. There was really no love for God, which uh, subsequently um, extended no love for the fellow man. Mm -hmm. uh, they didn't really need God, and they didn't need the fellow man. And, and uh, that condition is a serious condition. And uh, today, it is reflected significantly in... Uh, in Christianity, yeah. Today, this is the but, but we're actually double commendation. I know. the 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 issue here, though, in three seventeen, it says, "We have need of nothing." Knowest thou that thou art wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked? And it says, "Because I am in in rich in what? I am rich and wealthy. Yeah. And I'm increased in goods." Because we have, we don't think we need anything else. Go ahead. That's the man's point of view. You think you're rich, but God sees you were naked. And That's you're right. And nothing. Yeah. Because we see ourselves as we, we, we live. We don't, we, never, we don't need God. Yeah, then, go ahead. How many times have people talk about this? Pastors preach about it. When you're in need, oh, you need God and you remember God. But in the good times, when things are smooth, how often do we remember Him? I remember. I remember growing up. We were in the uh, village. The whole, all of us Adventists. When one family needs something, everybody's helping. Mm -hmm. And one uh, doing uh, opening salad, everybody sing in their own house. But we all helping each other. Yeah. Now, do I have that character? I don't. I'm the most selfish person. 
Okay, we need to move along here because we've just got a few minutes left. <coughs> this term poor that the Bible's talking about mm -hmm. <coughs> comes from the word P-T-O-C-H-O-S, which denotes extreme poverty. Right. It says we're blind, <coughs> we're miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Okay. That poor is extreme poverty. It's not just poverty. And we fail to see our condition. <coughs> yeah, and, and like Victor said earlier, it's so interesting that we don't see our condition, and yet this church has all the ISAB it needs. Yep. Their self-deluded pride prevents them from seeing themselves as they truly are. The counsels of the church to buy from him three things. <coughs> three things we're supposed to buy from God. One, Goal refined in the fire. Right. What is the refining process? Uh, the of life. Sanctification. It's all of those things. But when you refine gold, don't you burn out the impurities? Oh, it's uh, painful. And it is so painful to burn out the impurities um, in the fire. According to Peter, gold refined in the fire symbolized a tested, proven faith that can last till the end. Hey guys, thank you. Thank you. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. <clears throat> thank you for reading, guys. First Peter 1 7, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it be tried in the fire, might be found into the praise and honor and glory and the praying of Jesus Christ. He also offers these white garments, and we've talked about these white garments that were washed white through the blood. <clears throat> Yeah. And then, and, and that is, of course, Christ's righteousness. Yeah. So they'll walk with. It says he. They will walk with me in white. Revelation, four or five says, for they are worthy. He that overcometh the same will be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot his name out of the book of life. So we talked about this this whole issue of white robes, and we see it again <clears throat> in Revelation. 7 9. And I think I'm going to let you guys read that because a lot of this is talking about this robe of righteousness <coughs> that we are supposed to be wearing. And, and it's similar to what happened with the, the prodigal son. When the prodigal son came home, what did the father bring out? A robe to cover his sandals, a ring. His best robe, didn't he? Yes. His best robe. And but in Revelation 16, 15 says, I come as what? A thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keep his garments, lest he walk naked and see his shame. So this whole issue of keeping our garments white and walking with God is so truly important. Lastly, Jesus offers to the Laodiceans that ISAM, that spiritual ointment, so that we can see our true spiritual condition. And sometimes I think that's something we need to be praying for, is for God to show us our true spiritual condition. Right. What is ISAB? ISAB is like ointment in the eyes. The God? No, the, the, the ointment is to help you see. Yeah, the ointment helps you see because you're almost blind, but you put this ointment in your eyes and all of a sudden you can see again. You can see your condition. Mm -hmm. Doesn't Psalms 119 says, Open my eyes that I may behold the wondrous things of the law. The eyes of the heart may be enlightened that they may know <clears throat> that the riches and glory of inheritance in the saints. Ephesians also says that the, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and a revelation in the knowledge of him. Eight, verse 18, Ephesians 1.18 says, The eyes of your understanding may being enlightened, ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what riches of glory of his inheritance in the saints. The Christians in Laodicea need the discerning influence of the Holy Spirit to open their spiritual eyes so they may see their true condition. On one hand, the true riches of the inheritance of Christ makes available to them. <clears throat> On the other hand, Jesus counsels to buy them for them to buy gold, garments, and eye salve. The fact 
that items are not offered for free indicates that the Laodiceans must have something in exchange for what they need. They must give up pride, complacency, self-sufficiency to receive riches from Christ. Amen. Of the seven churches, only the Laodiceans and Philadelphians are ex explicitly told that they are loved by Jesus. Isn't that interesting? <clears throat> we are loved by Jesus. That's exciting too. And that there is hope for us. Too. Yeah. I, I consider that very good news because today's church is very much a reflection of La Odyssea. Mm -hmm. And that tells me God still loves us. It's exactly, exactly that. But he also says in Revelation 3.19, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. These words echo in Proverbs, for whom the Lord loves, he reproves. <clears throat> so we see that God disciplines us, So, but when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord. Hebrews talks about despise not chastening of the Lord. So Christ has not given up on the church. <clears throat> he makes every effort to make the church realize its own condition to break the chains of self-sufficiency which hold it down. The only remedy for the church is, the gen is genuine repentance. Jesus urges its members to turn away from their complacency and make a fresh start. Jesus concludes his appeal to them with one of the most impressive pictures. He portrays himself as standing at the door knocking. How many of you have seen that picture of Jesus standing at the door knocking? Amen. So this invokes a love, a love, and we see that in, in uh, the so Song of Solomon. Up to this point, the whole church is admonished, but now Jesus addresses individuals in the church. So now this is for us specifically. All those who open the door and welcome him in will have an intimate, loving dinner with him. Eating a meal together refers to an intimate relationship with a person. In this, in this case, with Christ, Jesus promises to share his throne with the overcomers in the church, just as he overcame and sat on his Father's throne. So those who, who do the, the work of overcoming will sit with Christ on his throne. That's very exciting. The fulfillment of this promise will be realized after his return to earth. Revelations 24 through 6, And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them. And judgment was given to them, and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither received his mark upon his forehead or in his hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. It is significant that while the number of promises to other churches increases in proportion with the decline of their spiritual condition, Laodicea, as bad as it is, <clears throat> is given only one promise. However, this promise incorporates all other promises given to the churches. To sit with Jesus on his throne means to have everything. The spiritual condition of the church in Laodicea represents the spiritual conditions of the church today. The strong verbal links with warning given in the context of preparing for the battle of Armageddon show that the message of the church in Laodicea has to be a model for the church at the time of the end. So this church <clears throat> exists in peculiar times. It goes on through the motions of great political, religious, and secular upheavals and faces its challenges that were not faced by any of the previous generations. So are we facing in our world today political, religious, and secular upheavals? Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. It faces challenges that were not faced Okay, by any other general. Yep, this church is self-sufficient and lukewarm, struggling, struggling with its authenticity. That's an interesting statement. Christ's warning to this church is far reach, has a far-reaching implication for all who are part of the church 
at the closing period of Earth's history. And again, Revelation 15, 16, 15 says, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watches, keep us his garments, lest he walk naked, and they see their shame. And then we will see Christ come. <clears throat> and the exciting part is that could happen in our lifetime. Yeah. Seeing Christ come could happen in our lifetime. But the thing is, that white horse is just the white horse. I know. The thing is, doing good without loving you is impossible. You but can't. I'm trying to work it out, and it's still, your heart is not there. I do it because I have. Yeah, well, we can't. Motive. We can't work it out. We we. On our own. Our, our heart is deceitful, you so we don't to get have, to work it out ourselves. You have to have the Holy Spirit, right? That's right. In you. Mm -hmm. And you have to want to have Christ in you as well. And it is a good pleasure. Why it's so hard. Yeah. Okay. Let's pray. Unless, were there any other comments? Anybody? No. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for this study, Lord, what you have done, what we have seen through time through the churches. Lord, I'm always in awe of this study when I see that you knew exactly what time periods would come, Lord. You truly know the beginning from the end. Lord, we wanna thank you for sharing these insights with us today. We wanna to share the spiritual nuggets <coughs> that you have shared with us. We pray, Lord, that you will open our eyes, that we will get that ice out, that we will be that church that conquers and washes our robes white in the blood of the Lamb. And Lord, we look forward to that day where we sit with you on your throne and eat with you and speak with you and learn those mysteries which we do not know now. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.